Hey everyone, I'm Walt, one of the High Rock pastors. In 1994, there was an earthquake in LA that knocked out the power to most of the city. Typically, the city is completely lit up at night, but that night, it was totally dark. When residents wandered out into the streets, many of them saw something in the sky that they had never seen before. It was huge and bright, and some were so alarmed by it that they called observatories and even 911 in fear. What was it? Was it the spaceship from Independence Day? No, it, it was just the, the Milky Way. They thought they knew what the night sky was, but really they were just getting a, a fraction of its magnitude and beauty. There, there was a whole world, or rather world, uh, of God's creation for them to experience and enjoy. But they were missing it because there was so much getting in the way. And we experience a similar dynamic when it comes to our inner lives as well. We might think that what we have going on inside of us can't even compare to the expansiveness of the Milky Way, but there is an incredible complexity to what's happening below the surface. Typically, if someone asks us how we're doing, we'll say, fine. But the reality is we're rarely just fine. We're, we're filled with highs and lows, questions, dreams, countless emotions and feelings, fears and anxieties, hopes, opinions, needs, desires, mood, wants, and much, much more. A better answer to that how you do in question might be, well, it's complicated. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that there's a lot going on. It's hard to sum up in a phrase or two. And this totally makes sense. Because in the beginning of today's scripture, David reflects back to God, you have searched me. And this word for search implies a thorough examination. There was a lot in David for God to see because that's the way that God made David. The, the way that God has made all of us. We've been made in God's image, in the character and likeness of God, and all of its complexity and mystery and beauty. Yet for many of us, like those LA residents, we fail to see it. And sometimes, when we do get a glimpse of what's really going on inside of us, we're frightened. There's way more going on in there than we thought. As a result, many of us have slipped into leading a divided life. A life where there is a separation between what we present to the world, what we say, what we do, how, do we, how we relate to others, and what's actually going on in our hearts and in our minds. Especially when it comes to feelings like anger or anxiety or shame. Things that we don't want to think about and definitely don't want other people to know. But the reality is that these things are going to come out one way or the other. It could be in a way that's incredibly painful and destructive or in a way that is healing and leads to our growth and life with God and others. We're in the middle of our fall sermon series, Full, Five Practices That Can Transform Ourselves and the World. Each week we're exploring a practice that can help us experience the fullness of life that Jesus offers instead of simply settling for something less than what we were created for. And today's practice is interior examination. And some of us might be quick to write, uh, write this off as pop psychology or self-help jargon. But as Rich Lotus points out in his book, The Deeply Formed Life, the Bible repeatedly calls us into self-examination as a part of our discipleship. In, in Lamentations, we read, let us test and, and examine our ways and return to the Lord. And the Apostle Paul is frequently calling the early church to examination. In the letter to the Galatians, he was concerned that the members were falling into a trap of comparison. And so he wrote, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Paul exhorted the church in Corinth to stop treating the communion table so cavalierly. Let a person examine themselves and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. This is why at High Rock we practice confession every week before taking communion. In light of the scriptures we just read that week, we want to examine ourselves to see where God might be inviting us to turn from our sin before receiving the grace of communion. And ultimately, Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Is there a consistency between what we profess we believe and what our lives look like? Or is there an inconsistency and dividedness in us? The only way we will know is by taking the time to look inward and ask ourselves, what is going on inside of us? To get at these questions, we first have to ask, or examine, if you will, what makes it so challenging to do this kind of work in the first place? 
In the same way that the bright lights of LA kept people from seeing the Milky Way, there are things in our lives that make it hard to truly get a glimpse of what is happening inside of us. For many of us, it is literally the, the light and the noise and the busyness of our lives that, that crowds out any space for examination. We opened up the sermon series talking about the challenge of busyness and the need for silence and contemplation. And one of the main casualties of failing to get those spaces is the opportunity for interior examination. We can't stop and reflect when we're constantly on the go or caught up in, in the glow of our screens. We might roll out of bed in the morning with this pit in our stomach and this tension in our bodies, but instead of bringing those feelings before God, we just slam down a cup of coffee and go. Over the course of the day, maybe a friend pokes fun of us, fun of us a bit or a colleague shares a critique on our performance and we feel this explosion of anger and rage, but we just smile. I'm fine. Everything is fine. And those feelings eat at us for hours. Until at night when we lay down and our minds are flooded with the failures of the day, that the ways that we snapped at our kids or, or didn't make that call to our parents, how we're behind in our work or our goals, feeling ashamed at any number of areas in our life. Have you ever had a, a day like that? I have. More often than I'd like to admit. Throughout the day, there were numerous moments where something was happening inside of me that I needed to be paying attention to and yet I didn't. I just kept moving. Like, Jesse Ventura and Predator, I, I ain't got time to bleed. Uh, I was hurt or ashamed or afraid, but life felt too demanding to slow down to pay attention to those things and ask God, what was behind them? Why was I feeling so tense or upset or ashamed? Why are the stakes so high for me in these moments? Or, or what idols are behind these reactions? I'll never know. Another reason that we might avoid this practice of examination is because We've been told what kind of feelings are and are not acceptable to feel. If we grew up in a volatile home, then maybe we never felt freedom to express anger or frustration. Perhaps we were told that crying was not an option in this house. The messages around feeling an emotion that we got from our parents or guardians can still have a significant impact on us today. Others of us have been formed in church contexts where there are certain emotions or reactions that we just weren't permitted to experience because they're unchristian. Sadness, doubt, anger, shame, fear. I mean, the, the Bible says not to be afraid over 300 times. You know, don't do it. But is that really what the Bible is saying? I, I had a good friend who would give me a glimpse uh, of a, a place of difficulty in his life, but then he would immediately cover it up with a, a promise of God or, or a part of God's character. My family's going through a rough time, he would say, but hey, God is good. I'm really struggling with something, but, but God has me in his hand. This situation is making me super anxious, but I, I know God will protect me. And at first, I was really impressed. This seemed to me like a pretty ironclad faith. But after a while, I started to notice that a lot of these situations were not improving. And, and the but gods seemed to be coming out more and more quickly in our conversations. I began to realize that instead of God's promises and character providing safety and security in which to process experiences of fear and doubt, these promises became excuses not to process his experiences with God. These scriptures, which should have been a source of comfort, acted as one big stop sign. My friend didn't feel like he had any place to turn with what was going on inside of him, but ignoring these emotions and situations did not magically make him go away. So instead of discussing with God how he might respond to these feelings, they, they continued to eat at him. Has that dynamic ever been a part of your own story? And at the end of the day, even if busyness or spiritual hang-ups aren't things that hinder you from practicing interior examination, then there's still probably one thing that keeps you from going there. Interior examination is hard. It, it can be really challenging to do the work of slowing down taking time to consider things like our motives, our, our fears, our self-centeredness, and then inviting God to speak into those things and, and show us how to move forward faithfully. Wouldn't we rather veg out than think about our past traumas and failures or, or numb ourselves with Netflix or another glass of wine instead of reflecting on unhealthy family dynamics? It is difficult to engage with the parts of us that we wish weren't a part of us. I'd like to pause here for a moment so you can reflect on some of these ideas. Namely, 
Is interior examination challenging for you? And if so, why? Take some time to talk with those around you or in the chat online. Welcome back. All too often, instead of doing the harder work of addressing our inner lives, we settle for the easier work, focusing on our outer lives. And as it turns out, we can shine up real nice when we want to. For some, we, we've got our degrees, our startups, our made it status, and, and a host of accolades and accomplishments that we can point to, to let people know we're doing great. For others, it can be our looks, or our fun personality, or our razor sharp wit. You know, nothing troublesome going on under all this. I'm fine, thank you very much. In Jesus' day, there was a group of people who were very much occupied with their outer lives, the Pharisees. They used all kinds of religious traditions and demonstrations as barometers for their holiness and spiritual health, while giving too little attention to what was going on inside of them. And as Jesus pointed out on many occasions, these discrepancies were huge. They lived massively divided lives. And there's an image from their world that captures this dynamic so well. According to their tradition, it was imperative that cups be cleaned to maintain their purity. However, the only thing that mattered was cleaning the outside of the cup. The inside was not a big deal, kind of like them. But that's not how Jesus saw things. And he called them out on it. He said, now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Jesus isn't talking about their cups. He's talking about their hearts. The inside matters to Jesus. He doesn't care how shiny that cup is on the outside. A friend of mine once told me a story that has seared itself into my mind, and let's see if it makes an impression on you. This friend was just living his life minding his own business, when all of a sudden he started developing a case of really bad breath. His girlfriend was like, hey, you, you got to get this figured out. So he, he tried everything. He, he doubled down on brushing and flossing, chewed gum constantly, gargled a crazy amount of mouthwash, but nothing works. And his breath actually got worse. One night, he and his girlfriend were watching a movie. And why she was still hanging around at this point, I have no idea. But they were sharing a bowl of popcorn when he accidentally bit down on a kernel. He heard this loud crack and immediately tasted something vile. He ran into the bathroom and saw that one of his molars had split in two, spilling black, nasty goo into his mouth. His tooth had been rotting from the inside out. And by this point, it was nearly hollow, save for the goo, of course. It didn't matter if he brushed 10 times a day or switched gallons of Listerine around his mouth. What was fundamentally wrong with his tooth was on the inside. Yeah, he got some early signs that something was off, but then came the moment when it was impossible to hide and, and the goo came out. I don't have any you know, dental horror stories like this, but I've got plenty of stories about times when stuff from the inside came spilling out in ways I didn't want. In, in August of 2020, we were ending what would be our first pandemic summer. Uh, I was still reeling from the challenges of the spring our daughter's school had reopened, so we were navigating a new schedule and routine, and we were preparing to launch High Rock Online, so my staff colleagues and I were as busy as we had ever been. I was tired, anxious, still confused and disoriented by the pandemic, going a million miles an hour, and my spiritual life by then was pretty shallow. Jen and my daughter and I were able to schedule a few nights in Vermont as a bit of a respite from the chaos. I thought, okay, maybe there... I can get a chance to rest and to be with God, to get some space to sort out everything that's been going on. But our, our first evening there, our toddler was driving me up the wall. 
would not cooperate, constantly resisting us. So I said, hey, let's go get some ice cream because usually that's a slam dunk to get things back on track. But as I'm putting her in her car seat, she starts resisting and flailing like again and she kicks me right in the eye. Now, I, I, I've been kicked in the face before, that's nothing new. But in that moment, I felt everything that had been going on inside of me, all of my raw frustration and sadness and anger at constantly being out of control just rushed to the surface. And, and I reeled back and I, and I moved to, to slam my hand on the roof of our car just to have some kind of outlet for those feelings. What I missed, probably because I was blind in one eye. And I put my hand right through the back window of our car. No one was hurt except me, thank the Lord. And I was only cut up a bit. But as I stood there holding my, my bleeding hand, I thought, what just happened? Have you ever had a moment like that? Where what was inside of you spilled out in ways that surprised you or, or scared you? It's not a good moment. And it might even reinforce the idea that we need to work even harder to keep things stuffed down. But, but we're only setting ourselves up for something worse down the road if we do. A week or two after my window moment, I was meeting with my spiritual director, Pastor Doug Calhoun. And I emotionally recounted this whole story to him. And I said, Doug, th this kind of thing can't happen again. Something has got to change. And he counseled me that if I didn't learn how to get in touch with the things that I was feeling and the reasons behind why I was feeling them and, and have a regular conversation with God about them, that kind of thing would definitely happen again. When Jesus was talking with the Pharisees about their divided lies, he said quite plainly, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? You know, our inner life matters to God because what's going on inside us will ultimately come out. We could know the Bible from, from cover to cover. We could be engaged in all kinds of powerful justice work. We could be leaders and influencers in our fields or in our neighborhoods. But if that is disconnected from the work that God is doing inside of us, it's just polishing the outside of the cup while the inside may be full of deadly germs. In this sermon series, we'll be talking about how to pursue racial righteousness, uh, experience sexual wholeness, and participate in God's mission to bring reconciliation throughout the world. These are huge things. But if we don't develop the practice of looking inward and inviting God to work with, work with us there, then it will all be for naught. How can we make strides in racial justice if we aren't paying attention to our own biases so that God would help us repent of them? How can we become peacemakers if we aren't asking God to heal us of bitterness and self-righteousness? How can we experience wholeness if our shame keeps us from inviting God to restore us? How can we move on mission if we're blind to our own idols of comfort and success? This might feel like a, a tall and difficult task, and it is. But David's words in Psalm 139 can change the game for us if we allow them. David's psalm begins with an honest acknowledgement. God sees him. God knows him. Verses 2 and 3 read, You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. There is no hiding from God. All of David's thoughts, all of his ways are, are known to God. Every feeling, motive, fear, and yearning. There may be things that David tries to hide from others or even hide from himself, but to God, everything is on display. This notion that God knows us completely, all the way down, can honestly be pretty frightening. Many of us might panic if our inner lives were brought out into the open, but, but David doesn't have that response. We don't see David trying to sheepishly cover anything up. And if anything, David is celebrating this reality. Why? Because David understands that God is for his good and that he needs God's help. And he knows that, that God's love is, is relentless, so much so that David can't help but marvel. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They are outnumbered by the grains of the sand. Honestly, that, that is just wild to think about. That God not only loves us in this remarkable way, 
But there is so much to us that is worth God's loving and worth God's thinking about. There is a vastness to us that even the Milky Way can't compete with. Some of us might feel like this is too good to be true. Surely there are parts of our lives that God would not want to see or deal with. God might just cancel us all together over them. But we can know that God sees everything and continues to love us all the same because of Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross reminds us that he sees the very depths of who we are and yet dies for us all the same. He has come not to condemn us, but to save us so that we would be forgiven and healed and redeemed. Jesus offers us the gift of full life. Not a life where Jesus just polishes us up on the outside, but where Jesus is bringing the full power of his resurrection to bear on our entire beings, including our innermost parts. Why would we want anything less than that? David, though, though he lived long before Jesus did, he understood this about God's character. It's why he could pray, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. <laughs> David found full life in examining his heart together with God. He even experienced it in praying this very psalm as he shifted his criticism of others back to reflecting on himself. He knew that God would use examination for his good to, to remove offensive ways the ways that were not leading to fullness, and that God would bring about new and everlasting life instead. Recently, I was catching up with an old friend, and he shared with me that last year he had a rock-bottom moment and was now involved in an AA program. The, the fourth step of AA is to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of oneself. My friend shared that it had been the most spiritually significant season of his life, because now he had nowhere to hide. The divided life he had been leading was now out in the open, and he had no chance but to confront what had been going on inside him for years. And as a result, he was experiencing healing in his relationship with God and others that he had never thought possible. Some of us have had moments like this. But we don't need to have a rock-bottom moment or, or put our hand through a car window in order to begin looking inside. We can all develop regular practices of interior examination now and experience more of God's full life now before we get to that breaking point. Pastor Dave began the series by calling us to break the bonds of busyness so that we can get some much needed silence and solitude with God. And when we have that space, interior examination is one of the things that we can fill it with. I, I've always found it helpful to have a set of questions or prompts to guide me through these times. The classic guide that Hyrock has spoken about many times in the past is simply called the examine. It has five steps for reflection. Become aware of God's presence. Review the day with gratitude. Identify where we experience God's presence and where we missed it. And pay special attention to your motive, emotions throughout the day. Ask for and receive forgiveness for the times that we fell short. And look toward tomorrow and invite God to lead us. These are great points of reflection that have blessed the, the church for centuries. And I also want to highlight another set of questions that have been helpful to me over the past few years. In April of 2017, Pastor Dave preached a sermon called, Tell Me What You Want, What You Really, Really Want, because he loves his catchy sermon titles. And in it, he shared another set of questions for reflection. They are, what am I feeling? What do I want? Is that what I really want? What am I afraid of? Are those fears real? And then as we get clarity on those answers, what does God want me to do with this? Dave recommended spending a month going through those questions each day. And in the past few years, I've done this several times, and I have found it to be transformative and healing in profound ways. It, it has helped me access feelings, fears, and desires that I struggle to articulate, and has kept negative emotions and fears from spilling out in destructive ways. I've recommended it to many high rockers along the way, and now I'm recommending it to you. Friends, remember that these spiritual practices today and throughout this series are, are not offered as yet one more thing to have you fit into your crowded lives. 
Rather, they are meant to refill you, refresh you, and to help you open up to the healing power of God. Like the dentist who wants to take a look at what's going on underneath the surface, our God wants to heal you, not hurt you. Every part of you, even the innermost parts. Thanks be to God.